Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar. Today's topic is examining consolidation in autism services, what you need to know before, during, and after a transaction. Today's presenters include Robert April, a senior associate at Provident Healthcare Partners, Stephen Grassa, an associate at Provident Healthcare Partners, Barry Alexander, a shareholder for Paul Sinelli, and Paul Gomez, also a shareholder for Paul Sinelli. I'd like to turn it over to Provident team to give a quick introduction on Provident. Thanks, Gina. This is Robert April, and I'm joined by my colleague, Stephen Grassa, and we're happy to uh, welcome all of you to this webinar and introduce you to uh, Provident and some of the topics we'll be talking about today. So just as a reminder of who Provident is, we are a healthcare service-focused investment bank, and really what that means is we advise business owners around the country, particularly in the healthcare services space, on transactions and, and capital events uh, throughout their business. We focus specifically on businesses that provide some level of care to patients, uh, whether that's broadly speaking physician services or particular to this webinar, physician services and uh, particularly autism services. We have a great deal of experience helping clinicians in the autism service world better understand and conceptualize what private equity and, and broadly consolidation is doing within the space, uh, help these business owners better understand how it can look within their business, the pros and cons, of a t transaction of that nature and how it can be beneficial and also how it can change the, the profile of the business and ultimately once they've gotten to a point where it makes sense to, to pursue a potential transaction, we represent them through that business and ultimately help guide and advise them through the, the transactional process. Uh, we've been in business for over 20 years and we're headquartered in Boston as well as have another location in Los Angeles. Uh, I will now turn it over to Paul and Barry to introduce Paul Sinelli. Thank you, Robert. Uh, this is Paul Gomez, and uh, Barry, please feel free to chime in and add anything if you think I missed a, a certain point. And I just want to give a quick overview on our firm, Polsonelli. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with Polsonelli, it is a national full-service firm, but healthcare is one of our core uh, areas of focus for the firm. We have one of the largest healthcare practice groups in the country with over 110 lawyers focusing uh, substantially in the healthcare space and working with healthcare providers in all sectors uh, within healthcare in most of our offices, again, across the country, including autism service providers. And when I mention different kinds of sectors and industries, some of those also include those in the behavioral healthcare sector. And if you'll see on the next uh, slide, we have some statistics and information that's specific to behavioral health care group, we have what uh, we believe is the largest behavioral health care group in the country with over 40 lawyers who practice in some depth uh, in a range of areas of behavioral health care across the country. I'm the chair of the group and Barry is also a member of the behavioral health care group. And for both health care more broadly and behavioral health care more specifically, our firm is, in, is involved in advising clients with regard to mergers and acquisitions joint ventures of all kinds, reimbursement, payer contract negotiations, payment and reimbursement dispute issues, audits, investigations, both uh, government included and state and federal level, HIPAA and privacy issues, licensing and certification issues, and also uh, in behavioral health, unique real estate and zoning issues. And we're very pleased to be able to have the opportunity to present and co-present at this co-webinar with Provident today. With that, I'll hand it back over to Robert and Steve. So this slide will touch on the autism services landscape, how it looks today, and why a lot of these firms, private equity firms and uh, private equity-backed platforms are looking at the space and looking to make an investment in the space. I'm sure many of you are familiar with a lot of the macro economic tailwinds that are propelling the sector forward. Um, you know, we've mentioned a few here. Diagnosis rates are trending upwards. You know, rewind to the early 2000s, and it was one in every 160 children were diagnosed with autism. Um, and fast forwarding today, it's that number is now one in every 40 American children diagnosed with with the disorder, according to new governmental studies. So, you couple increased incident levels with a nationwide shortage of providers. Um, you know, we're at a we're at a point here where we would need to double 
the amount of BCBAs to meet the current needs of um, children and families with autism nationwide. So there is a you know, very large supply and demand imbalance within the sector, and it's you know a lot of the states are taking notice and expanding coverage for autism treatment. Um, back in 2001, only one state um, required private insurance to cover autism treatment, whereas today all 50 states now require uh, commercial payers and funders to, to cover autism services. So it's a very underserved space um, and private equity community sees an opportunity in um, taking advantage of a lot of the uh, macroeconomic tailwinds that are prop propelling the sector forward. And moving on to the next slide. Um, this is a similar slide in that we outline a lot of the factors attracting private equity capital just against the backdrop of the greater behavioral health uh, space. You'll see uh, a, a chart at the in the middle of the page. It's basically a maturity scale um, of all the different segments within the behavioral health space, which has um, attracted a lot of private equity dollars over the last five or six years. Um, you know, subsectors within the space include substance abuse, addiction treatment, eating disorders, psychiatry, special education services, but you'll notice that um, autism services is relatively immature um, relative to, you know, some of these other subsectors within the behavioral health space and is it there, you know, the earliest of, of uh, stages on this maturity scale for reasons that we outline on the left-hand side of the page. So. A lot of the qualities of the market that makes it make it prime for consolidation, you know, one, it's in the very early stages. Um, rapid consolidation has really only occurred over the last few years. Um, the first investment in the space was back in 2010, and we'll touch on that transaction a little bit later. But um, it took a while for things to pick up, and the bulk of transaction activity, you know, over 90% of, of, of deals in the space have occurred in the last few years. Um, and with you know three to seven year hold periods for private equity firms, a lot of those firms have not exited their investment, so there have been just a handful of secondary transactions in the space to date. Um, it's a very fragmented market, which is conducive to the private equity model of acquiring you know other providers and rolling them up into the you know a combined entity and platform. There are you know some large multi regional players, most of which are backed by private equity dollars, but there are a lot of very small providers in the space that serve as you know, kind of a roll-up opportunity for platforms backed by private equity capital. And then we touched on a lot of the, you know, the supply and demand imbalance dynamic within the sector and you know, the fact that with 30,000 BCBAs you know, throughout the country, you know, it's, it's just you know, completely outpaced by the demand for services that you know has increased in recent years through public awareness, through increased diagnosis rates, and um, expanded commercial coverage. Um, you know, you know, as we're in the early stages of of consolidation, there are certain ways that you know private equity firms can help to professionalize and advance the ABA therapy market and propel it forward. Um, we touch on a few on the bottom right hand uh, portion of the page here. You know, one is investment, investing into the infrastructure and back office of the business. So basically investing in administrative functions so that clinicians can focus on, on care, investing in technology to help um, you know, better track outcomes. And then um, from a, from a roll-up and consolidation standpoint, you know, there's a real opportunity for a lot of the smaller providers that are you know, having trouble competing in their markets to align with a larger organization and benefit from a lot of the, you know, um, a lot of centralized back office functions and uh, benefits of scale, both from a cost saving perspective and from a revenue perspective, um, as as it relates to getting to a point of size and scale where you know you'll have a real seat at the table with with funding sources and with payers in um, in rate negotiations. So on the next slide, so when we think about private equity investment and, and really how the life cycle of that investment functions really within, within any space, but particularly within autism services, typically there's 
some of the more forward-thinking private equity funds that make investments early on, and it's a little bit more sporadic. And as there's more of those investments that take place and it becomes a little bit more commonplace in the space, you'll start to see more of these groups dovetail onto their brethren, other private equity groups, and you'll start to see the increase in occurrences of these investments. And ultimately, that's what we've seen in this space. Steve mentioned that the first investment by a private equity fund into the autism services space was back in 2010. And on this chart that we show on the top here, the stars represent platform investments into the space. And what you'll see is that those investments into autism services were still fairly sporadic, even up until 2017, at which point you really see the faucet being turned on from these private equity dollars flooding into the space. And when you think about why does private equity look at autism services, and it relates to the last two slides in which Steve walked through. Private equity focuses on a problem solution type investment thesis. They look at all the different spaces within healthcare or even more broadly and say, where are areas that there are problems that exist within the, the market that we can help solve through whatever strategic uh, initiatives or whatever strategic um, expertise that we have as a fund. And so when they look at autism services broadly, they see all of the problems or issues within the space that was previously mentioned, whether it's provider shortages, whether it's turnover, whether it's lack of sophistication and back office that exist within these groups that have built out over, over a number of years, whether it's groups that have just expanded rapidly through the patient demand and haven't been able to build the, the, the real infrastructure to support the size in which they've reached, whether it's management teams not able to supply the investment to build that infrastructure or you know, build out the internal nature of the business to support the growth that's happened, private equity is able to come in and, and really help fill some of those holes, not on the clinical side, certainly re relying on past management and the clinical management of the businesses, but able to help solve some of those solutions. And so once they see and better learn what those issues are and those problems are that private equity is able to help solve, that's where you start to see the mass wave of consolidation of the space because it becomes very clear what those problems are and how the private equity model can help fill those solutions. And so, you know, looking at 2018 forward, we see almost monthly or bi-monthly, you're starting to see these platform investments being made, really private equity groups making those large-scale investments into ABA service companies. And forward-looking into 2020 and beyond, we continue to see that we're going to see similar levels of consolidation like we've seen in 2018 and 2019, largely because of how fragmented the market continues to be. Even though we have 30-plus different what we call platform investments, basically private equity-backed consolidated entities out there in the space from coast to coast, there continues to be a vast majority, 80, 90% of the market that continues to be fragmented. So there's a lot of runway when we think about opportunities for private equity to partner with leading management teams across the country. So on to the next slide. I think even taking a step back around, we've been talking about private equity, but even taking a step back to what is private equity, because oftentimes, especially in the groups that we're working with here at Provident, these are businesses in the ABA space that were started because they felt a need in the market, whether it was an ex-RBT or an ex-BCBA that saw a need or necessity in whatever geography they were in and started a business to help fill that patient need. They were never built to sell. They weren't entities that were constructed to, to sell to private equity down the road. So oftentimes, the introduction of the concept of private equity is, is very new and foreign to these groups. And so we start the conversation not with you know, how does the private equity model function within a, a business, but more so starting, well, what is private equity? And, and so on this slide, we look to touch on you know, what is the, the component of private equity? What is this word, this, this fund that we keep hearing about? So ultimately, what private equity is, is exactly what the, the sounds of it are. It's a, it's a pool of capital that looks in, to invest in private businesses. So when you think about the public markets, you have funds like mutual funds, hedge funds, things like that that focus in on, on investing in publicly available assets. Private equity, on the other hand, is similar in nature of it's a pool of capital coming from different sources, but here they focus on making anywhere from five to ten investments into privately held assets. So it's a way for funding sources like mutual, or I'm sorry, like uh, endowment funds, insurance, high net worth individuals to make investments into private companies to, to go alongside all the investments they have in the, pri uh, the public market world as well. And obviously Harvard Endowment isn't going to go out and make individual investments into businesses themselves, 
they're going to give that capital to management teams or general partners of private equity groups that will then go out and deploy that capital on their behalf. And so when you think about who comprises a private equity fund, the dollars it's coming from, the limited partners, which as I mentioned, are the endowment funds of the world, insurance companies, uh, high net worth individuals, et cetera, that are giving the funds to these general partners who then go out and make investments into a number of portfolio companies. Typically, they're going to have specific industries that they focus on and sizes as well. So just like you invest into a, a mutual fund that, that focuses on you know, large cap energy or consumer uh, stocks, private equity groups are going to focus on the same thing, where they're going to focus on lower middle market healthcare businesses uh, or, you know, Things, things of that nature. So the groups that are making investments into autism services oftentimes have a large component of their fund focused on healthcare, and then within that, they're going to look to, to identify sectors within broadly healthcare that they can deploy capital in and, and meaningfully change the dynamic of those businesses within that industry and ultimately grow and exit that, that investment uh, over the holding period of three to seven years. <clears throat> That ultimately is how private equity makes money, is by acquiring an asset in year one, helping grow that asset along, uh, along with the management team, and exiting that asset in, call it, three to seven years. They're not looking to strip profits out of the business in, in this world. It's not like they're buying it for uh, the cash generation of those businesses, other than the fact that they're looking to grow it over that time period and sell it for return at the end of whatever that investment time frame looks like. When we think about what private equity actually comes in and does, it really a lot of it has to do with coming in, partnering with a management team that currently has some size and scale, identifying what are those growth levers within that business that they can help fuel. So whether it's growing the number of locations, if it's a center-based ABA provider, whether it's helping with the recruitment and expanding geographies in the home home-based side of, the, of ABA therapy, whether it's, you know, we're, we're stretched thin in the back office, we need to bring billing and collecting in-house, we need to hire a CFO, we need to expand our uh, HR department, or maybe we're not leveraging marketing as much as we should in, in getting our name out there in the community, things like that, where it's dollars and time spent, and, and today the business doesn't necessarily have the capital or, or time to commit to those initiatives, but through the, the ability to bring in private equity, offer some of those capital and, and bring in some of that leverage and experience to help grow through that and, and really focus on not just growing the platform that we have today, but actually taking it and expanding it. Maybe we have 100 RBTs today and 20 BCBAs. Well, how do we grow to 50 BCBAs and 300 RBTs over time and, and it's spread across a broader geographic range because now we have a bigger management team that can manage a wider circumference of geography. And that's really what, what private equity focuses on, is creating a, a very creative and, and individualized growth story for that business and not coming in and trying to uh, jam a, a square peg into a round hole. And moving on to the next slide, which uh, piggybacks ni nicely um, off of Bobby's comments around growth and, and approaching growth in a, in a thoughtful and controlled way, because although this slide touches on the benefits of a private equity partner, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention a lot of the concerns and fears out there around, you know, loss of quality of care, around um, commercializing care, for lack of a better phrase, where, you know, groups are focused on the bottom line and profitability of the business versus, um, versus you know, care for, for kiddos and for their clients. And so um, it's important to, for groups to be thoughtful around their growth strategy on a moving forward basis. You know, some of those concerns are, are, are certainly legitimate, but uh, for the most part, you know, a lot of the advantages that we're seeing are around supporting the clinicians and augmenting what's already in place to create a platform um, with, um, you know, care that's, that's, that's top notch. And so we touch on a lot of these advantages here. One, expanding patient count. Um, and, you know, I'm talking specifically about, you know, those clients that are in underserved areas. So. What a private equity firm has is, you know, they not only have the data to identify those underserved markets, but they also have the capital and resources to execute and build out a presence in those underserved markets and, you know, expand their reach to a, a client base that, you know, otherwise had limited access to care. Um, you know, growth objectives through organic means or through um, acquisitions. Um, you know, a big part of the private equity model is to grow through acquisitions, you know, but there are also certain groups that grow organically through de novo growth as well. 
um, you know, both both uh, modes of growth have pros and cons, but you know there are a number of different models out there that we've seen play out in the market, and it's important to you know vet your partner in in deciding which avenue of growth is is best on a moving forward basis. Um, another big key advantage to partnering with a private equity firm is the infrastructure that they'll build out upon um, the transaction. You know, investments in reporting systems and technology to better track outcomes. Um, investment in the administrative function of the business so that you can completely take the administrative bur- burden off of the clinician so that they can focus on um, what they do best and which is which is care for their patients. Um, expanding service lines again, this can be done through you know organic organic means um, in adding you know contiguous service lines to the existing business or through acquisition. We had actually a client. Um, that aligned a client that focused on clinic-based ABA therapy. They aligned with a speech pathology-focused business, and so both groups were able to share best practices amongst one another post-closing, and um, and integrate and um, potentially build out the other's um, primary service line. Um, recruiting clinical talent. You know, this can be as 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 we right here in, in the field level or on a supervisor level. So. A lot of these private equity firms um, are able to, you know, tap into their resource well and, and um, improve recruiting efforts um, by, you know, way of um, you know, additional resources they can bring to the table. And you know, a lot of other, a lot of these groups are usually pretty competitive when it comes to compensation and benefits as well to help bring in, you know, top tier talent at the in the field level and at the supervisor level as well. Um, and then the last box here, providing industry expertise, kind of like a catch-all bucket. You know, this can be um, uh, hiring an operator with a tremendous amount of experience operating, managing, and scaling autism service businesses. We mentioned technology to uh, better track outcomes and using data to grow in a very um, controlled and thoughtful manner. And so, moving on to the next slide here. Um, we outline a few different case studies of, of groups that have gone through a couple iterations of private equity. Um, Bobby mentioned that a typical hold period is three to seven years where a private equity firm will make an investment, help grow the business, and then exit to a larger private equity firm. We've called out a couple different scenarios that have played out in the, in the autism services space so far. Um, the first is a, a seven-year hold period, and you know we'll, we'll touch on some of the specifics of of that investment. But Great Point Partners uh, made an investment into Autism Learning Partners in 2010, exited in 2017 to a larger private equity firm, FFL Partners, and then more recently, um, LLL Partners, who made an investment into Learn It Systems in 2016, exited their investment to Griffin Investors in 2019. So. The three-year hold versus the seven-year hold is indicative of just how active a space the autism services market is today. You know, back in 2010, when Great Park Partners did their transaction and recapitalization with Autism Learning Partners, you know, there weren't many um, deals to be had in you know the following years in 2011, 2012, 2013, because the market wasn't as frothy at that point. So, Great Point Partners. Um, invested into Autism Learning Partners back in, again, 2010. They had 11 offices. They were in three states. They had about 300 employees. Over the course of their investment, they made six acquisitions. They brought in a CEO to focus on integrating the different clinics, focus on um, reducing turnover, and they eventually exited their position to FFL Partners. And at the time of their exit, they were now in nine states and they had over 2,500 employees. So it was a very successful hold period for, for Great Point Partners, and a, a one that's you know typically on the longer end of a, of a typical standard private equity um, holding period. You know, fast forward to the most recent secondary transaction, LLR Partners' transaction with Griffin Partners. Again, um, very successful investment, a couple of landmark transactions, including you know, autism spectrum therapies, total spectrum. We call out four transactions in the in the middle circle here, but um, LLR partners uh, transacted or you know made over ten acquisitions over their just three year hold period, which again, you know the the difference in 
in timelines, three years versus seven years, is just very indicative of how active the autism services space is today. So on the next slide, we touch on you know, what are the different options that exist for the for a group that uh, in ABA practice or ABA business as they think about you know the future. Obviously, continuing to to stay autonomous and continue to stay independent is always an option for a lot of groups as they sit and wonder you know, what is the future of my business over the next five ten years and how do I position myself to be successful in the ever changing market especially as the payer landscape changes the competitiveness of the, the industry changes how do I continue to position myself to be successful you know we've talked a lot about private equity uh, so when we advise our clients we always talk through what are the different buckets of what we call a partner or an investor into the business and the way that we bucket it is into private equity, PE-backed platforms, and then strategic. Uh, starting with strategic because it tends to be you know, typically kind of the most obvious when we think about who they are. It's the UHSs, the Acadias of the world, the publicly traded businesses that operate within the space, that make acquisitions, that basically the large machine that can then make acquisitions into smaller businesses, whether they're looking to expand geographically or expand service offerings in geographies they already exist in. The benefit from a business owner's perspective of this type of transaction is that there is a great cash at close component to it. These businesses are able to fund these transactions with a lot of cash. There's a lot of synergies they can leverage. So they're able to sometimes pay a premium. In a lot of instances, you can gain leverage of the larger strategic company groups like UHS and Acadia obviously have a lot of best practices and things that they can leverage and help spread across the breadth of their system. From a cons perspective, you know, obviously there's not a lot of place for that existing management team to continue to hold high level management positions within entities like that because as you can imagine they already have a fairly well built out infrastructure um, and obviously the autonomy of the business is going to go away as you kind of fold into that that broader platform but for a lot of groups it offers a really nice opportunity because as a for management teams that are looking to step away or management teams that are looking to to really leverage size and scale of a larger business you know certainly those types of groups offer that type of option PE backed platform and PE. The way that you think about these is different from strategic, but then different even amongst the two of them is on the previous slide when, when Steve walked through uh, the, those transactions, when Great Point Partners made the investment into autism learning partners, that's what we call platform investment. And so Great Point Partners was a private equity acquirer. It was a group that didn't currently have an investment in the ABA space, was looking to make that platform investment and did so with Autism Learning Partners. So that's that far left column. The middle column is effectively what Autism Learning Partners became once they had the backing of Great Point Partners. And so all of those acquisitions or those logos that you saw in the circles in the middle of the previous slide, those were all add-on acquisitions and that buyer uh, autism Learning Partners or LEARN are the PE-backed platforms that are out there. There's 30 plus, as I mentioned earlier on, that are looking to make acquisitions and again expand geographically, expand uh, via, via service line. And so kind of across those two, the benefit of a private equity or private equity-backed platform as opposed to a strategic is a, what's called a rolled equity component. So typically you're not selling 100% of the business. You're going to continue to own some level of the business moving forward and benefit economically as that business grows through the partnership with private equity and as that equity value grows. So while you've sold a component of the business, you now own a smaller piece, but the hope is as that pie grows, that smaller piece is worth more as you grow. You continue to con control more of the autonom autonomous nature of the business, particularly in the private equity option. So that offers you the partnership with a private equity group and the autonomy of the clinical management of the business is going to continue to stay with you. That disappears a little bit with the PBAC platform. As you, can, as you can guess, they already have an asset in the space, so there's going to be some cross-functionality there and, and some best practices they're able to spread through add-on acquisitions. But again, you're still leveraging the ability to have a private equity engine behind you, have some of that rolled equity or that continued ownership component. Um, some of the cons of, of these types of situations with private equity, it's less of an exit strategy, so sometimes we're talking with management teams that, again, are looking to either retire, step away, move on to the next part of their life. In most instances, private equity is going to look for the management team to stay on board. It's indicative of really their investment thesis of building and partnering with the management team versus them coming in and being clinicians, which they certainly aren't. So if that's really a, a goal of management, you're probably going to want to look at a P-backed platform type option or a strategic option. 
also a con of the PE backed platform. Typically there's a management team already in place at whatever that platform is. So there's not always the option for the, the CEO or the owner of, of the add-on acquisition to hold a board level or, or a C-level uh, position. That's certainly an option in, in some instances. In a lot of our transactions we do with, with groups, that does become an option, but it's not always the case. And also, because you are merging with another group or being acquired by another provider, you know, there is that potential for a class of organizational cultures, and which kind of leads onto some of the other topics that we talk about, which are you know, the culture of which the, the group that you're partnering with is, is ever important. And so when we think about working with our clients, it's always focused on running a broad process to, to really look at all different of the three of these buckets, compare them, and really figure out what is the best for the business. And then moving on to the next slide here, I think a lot of times when we start working with groups, they, they think, or businesses, they really think about private equity as kind of one interchangeable word. It, that all these private equity funds are the same, they're all looking to make this investment grow us this way, and there's really no variance or difference between them. And I think that that is oftentimes the first mistake groups make when they think about it that way. When you want to think about private equity, just like any other business line, even particularly in your business, in the, in the ADA therapy, there's good providers and there's bad providers. Private equity is no different. There's groups that come in and can be very effective in partnering with ABA providers, grow a business thoughtfully and be very successful in doing so, both financially, but equally, if not more important, clinically. And there's obviously the ones that are gonna come in and, and not do so. You know, we have enough feedback from groups out there in the space that, that know of a story within private equity investing into ABA where you know, some of the reputation has been lost and some of that clinical integrity has, has swayed a little bit and there's also stories where they've been able to grow and do so very successfully and so when thinking about that partner it's very important for you to consider you know, what capable management do they have? Have they hired, has this private equity group have experience within the space? I mentioned that uh, later in the slide. Do they have a history of successful partnerships broadly within healthcare and then specifically within behavioral health. One of the most important things to consider is the cultural fit. Just as if you were hiring an employee, equally if not more so important here, you're bringing in a partner. Culturally, do the, is there synergies there? Is this a, an individual or a group of individuals that you can have dinner with, work with very closely over the next five to seven years? It becomes in, increasingly important. What kind of style of investment do they have? Are they very hands-on? Are they very hands-off? Not all groups are the same when they think about how hands-on they want to be. Uh, vice versa, not all of our clients are looking for that hands-on treatment. They want a hands-off investment approach versus the opposite where they need more hands-on help and they're looking for that type of, of uh, expertise from a private equity group. So there's a lot of different components to consider here and as we, you think about the broad private equity world, it's very important to understand that each one of them brings different variables and looking at the culture and the, the past successes and experiences uh, in the investment style is all very important when weighing what's the right partner for the group. And on the next slide, one of the most common questions we get is what makes one business in autism services more enticing or interesting to private equity or buyers in general than another? And, and so what we've listed here is a number of components of a business that not only make it more interesting, but also you know, as we as you know, groups get more involved in this, what what makes it more valuable? What increases valuations in these types of transactions? And very quickly, kind of going through these you know, strong infrastructure and making investments in the back office is always very important. Have you invested in having in-house billing? What does your IT and HR departments look like? Do you have a CEO, CFO, CMO? Have you made investments into management? Looking at your payer mix, is it diversified amongst a number of payers? Are you in network with those payers? Are you spread across a larger regional footprint? Are you not just operating in one city, but have you expanded that reach into a broader regional footprint? What is your track record of being able to recruit and retain talent? One of the biggest issues that plagues the industry nationally is retention and turnover, especially at the RBT level. Are you able to show that you're able to recruit additional RBTs, meet demand, and, and retain those RBTs through whatever systems you have in place as a business? Again, what does your management team look like? What do growth opportunities look like? Have you identified other areas of expansion, whether it's expanding in the clinic-based model, whether it's expanding home-based geographies and the like? What is your track record? Clinically, are you sound? Those are, that's kind of a, a check mark type thing because they're looking for exactly, they're looking for high clinical excellence 
amongst all the different service lines that you offer. And again, size and scale. What is that size? At the end of the day, the financial size and sophistication of the business is very important in these transactions and certainly lends itself to, to higher valuations as you grow in size. So with that, I'll turn it over to Paul and Barry to walk through some of the key legal issues. Thanks very much. And this is Paul Gomez at Pulsinelli. I'll start us off on some of the legal issues, uh, Demine, and some solutions. And if we could move to the next uh, slide, the first one here is a little bit of an outline, and we'll go into a little more depth in a couple of slides that, that follow it. I think um, the, some of the things that Provident was mentioning in terms of, of uh, looking for the right partner uh, are a nice lead-in into uh, this segment of the, of the presentation. And when I think of and look at the first bullet here about marketing and partner selection, uh, and this presumably after taking certain steps, if you are a seller, to be able to get yourself ready to be on the market, and we'll get into a little more depth in that in a moment. Uh, getting clear about what it is really you're looking for as a seller, if you're coming at it from the seller uh, perspective. And some of that, I think, does touch on uh, you know, what your goals and objectives are, where you want this business to go uh, over the next three years, five years, seven years, uh, what you're looking for in terms of autonomy, uh, versus uh, a potential private equity partner that is uh, possibly a little more uh, hands-off. So getting clear about, I think, what it is that, as a seller anyway, that you're looking for in terms of objectives is then going to help you make clearer, crisper decisions about what po potential partner might be the right fit for you. And when you get past that point and start moving a little further down into the next major milestones toward a successful closing, looking at the letter of intent stage. Uh, there that, and we'll get into more detail in a moment on that, but that is basically going to serve as your point to start sketching out the broader parameters and some of the core terms that you're gonna to wanna to ensure uh, are further fleshed out and detailed in your definitive uh, agreements. Uh, we'll talk about a few of those in just a moment. Due diligence is a key component, and this should go in alignment with negotiation of your definitive, um, your definitive agreements, be those the purchase agreement, uh, be those uh, other ancillary agreements that may come into play depending upon how, what the structure of your deal is, whether there's any management arrangement that may be involved, others, uh, and the schedules. Uh, the schedules become a very important part of moving through the deal process. We'll get into that in a moment as well. We have licensing, payer uh, issues, material contracts and consents. Very important to get uh, in front of these early on. Uh, some of these issues can have some significant uh, advance approval times, times to get the consents, times to get approvals, times to determine what uh, contracts may require consent. So the earlier lead time we have on those, the more likely we are to get to a successful closing and to get to one in a timely fashion. And then finally, the closing stage, once we've run through the definitive agreements, uh, important to early in the process. And these, for, these bullet points that come right before, I think, help to inform these decisions about what is a realistic closing time, what are the conditions to close that need to be uh, insisted upon by either the buyer or the seller, what needs to be delivered uh, at the closing before the deal can be completely consummated. And then use, uh, I, we would generally recommend of a closing checklist that's shared between the parties that identifies what the key deliverables are, what the key components are that need to occur at a minimum before we can get to closing, and which particular party is primarily responsible for each uh, item. Those things will also help to facilitate a smooth and timely closing. Uh, so with that, if we could uh, go to the next slide, we'll get into a little more depth on some of these terms that uh, focus on the, the letter of intent. So we start off at the top with obviously price. Money is going to be a uh, you know, key component. And uh, we've, had, we've had some discussion, I think, about uh, whether earnouts might be a component of a purchase price. Uh, we do see those uh, in autism and other, in other deals, although, and I don't know if others have had a different experience with this, uh, at least I think we've seen over some time, a little less frequent use of, of earnouts over the years. They're not gone, but uh, declining at least from some of the deals that we're seeing. And there's some considerations, I think, that, that anybody should bear in mind about whether an earnout is an appropriate uh, component of a purchase price. 
it may carry some risk uh, depending upon the uh, the provider and depending upon the payers that are at issue. So for example, uh, if you have an autism provider or other healthcare provider who intends to uh, remain actively involved with the business post-close and is in a position to continue to refer patients to the autism uh, services provider, and you have government payment involved, either uh, Medicare, probably more likely Medicaid uh, or other, that may heighten the risk in terms of having uh, an earnout from an anti-kickback uh, perspective. If you don't have those components in place, an earnout may present less of, a, um, of an anti-kickback risk. And there may be some uh, considerations one might take in structuring some component of the purchase price to be, uh, to be contingent or paid over time, but not necessarily directly tied to revenue targets. And that might end up still getting you to the same place you wanna go as a buyer if an earnout component is important to you, but not tying directly to revenue could also have the effect of lessening any earnout risk that may be present. So there are some, some options potentially available there. The next is uh, process duration and exclusivity of due diligence and whether to what extent you want to define that in your letter of intent. Uh, in some cases, it is important to really describe in detail exactly how long the due diligence process is going to last. Do we want to set uh, a 60 day period, 45 day period? Uh, you know, what is the, what is the commitment there? Certainly the buyer in most uh, or all cases is going to want to ask that that be a closing condition that they're satisfied with their due diligence process and the buyer will usually be incentivized to try to uh, not put a specific timeline necessarily on due diligence. The seller in many cases will be incentivized to try to get more definition around that and like to have some assurance that at some point before the close that due diligence process will be done and that the buyer will already be satisfied with closing and that's a, a frequent point of negotiation in the letter of intent, um, in the letter of intent process. Then we have risk allocation, um, and you know the degree to which we want to define these in their letter of intent, then to be further fleshed out in the definitive agreements. Escrow is one means of risk allocation, and typical ranges that we'll see in an indemnity escrow uh, account and agreement might be about 10% or so of the purchase price, uh, with about a 12 to 18 month duration. Again, these things all can vary depending upon the particular circumstances of the deal, depending upon what liabilities may or may not be found or risks may be present or not. Uh, but these are some typical ranges that we see. There could be liability caps uh, that are imposed and these are all often points of, of substantial negotiation. Usually if there is a cap, we'll see 20% and up. Again, can vary depending upon the liabilities or risk that may be identified and present. Uh, and we see some variation on that depending upon whether we're talking about representation and warranties that are fundamental reps. And fundamental reps, some examples of those would include uh, due, due organization of the uh, corporate structure of the seller, proper authorization to engage in the transaction, healthcare regulatory issues uh, because of the increased potential for liability surrounding those, taxes, uh, environmental compliance issues, not an exhaustive list, but just by way of giving a few examples of what fundamental reps can be and what we do often see in letters of intent and definitive agreements. You might also choose to use baskets as a means of risk allocation. And that means, you know, we're looking at a range of 0.5 to 1% of the purchase price being a somewhat typical um, range that we'll frequently see. Uh, a basket is if, you, if, you, you, if you're a uh, buyer and you're seeking indemnification, you can't seek that indemnification until you get to a certain threshold. So for instance, if your basket is a $50,000 amount, uh, you have to wait until your liabilities claim for indemnification at least arise to that level. Then after that, you can pursue indemnification claims and there's some point of negotiation and variance about whether you only seek indemnification for, inde for claims amounts above 50,000 or once you meet the threshold, you may be able to go back to dollar one uh, of the claims. And that again is a, a frequently negotiated point. And then finally on risk allocation, how long do the representations and warranties made by either party survive? As a general baseline, we usually see somewhere between 12 to 24 months after the close. 
It can vary, again, depending upon the facts and circumstances of a particular transaction. And uh, it is not uncommon to see exceptions and carve-outs for that survival period for fundamental reps, uh, which will be negotiated by the parties. And those extensions can sometimes be anywhere from you know, six years to perhaps a statute of limitations-based representation. And in some cases, uh, no outside limit on the survivability, depending upon the fundamental rep that may be involved. And then in letter of intent, whether you want to build in certain contingencies, which, and this is, a, there's an overlap here with closing conditions. So uh, whether any financing needs to be secured by the buyer in order to consummate the deal. Obviously the seller will be incentivized and probably may prefer a buyer who does not have a financing contingency, but they are not um, unusual necessarily by any means. And we've certainly worked with those situations. If any licensing uh, approvals, applications, notices or consents from different government agencies are involved. Those we need to identify early on so that we don't have surprises. We can accurately gauge the timing of the transaction and get you to successful closing. Uh, whether you have key personnel issues that need to be identified. You wanna make sure that certain persons are employed by the buyer uh, or have an independent contractor arrangement with them. We'll, we'll be part of the business going forward and any non-competition issues that may be related to that to ensure that the buyer's investment is protected and that sellers won't be competing uh, anywhere nearby in the near future as we look to invest in, and grow the, grow the business. And as a final point on letter of intent, we'll say that generally most terms are non-binding. That doesn't mean they don't have any value or effect. Uh, in our experience, they really do serve to guide the parameters and the core deal terms. Uh, as we move forward into the definitive agreements that really flesh those obligations out. But there are some common exceptions to, to uh, non-binding provisions in, in a letter of intent. Those are often the exclusive, exclusive negotiations period, confidentiality provisions among the parties, that the parties won't make public statements about the deal without the other's consent, and what governing law will govern any disputes that may arise in the unfortunate education that, or uh, instance that they do. So with that, we'll turn quickly want, to the next slide. Oh, go ahead. I want to just dive, I just want to dive in real quickly. I know we're going to come to the end here, but there are a couple of points here just to amplify. And one of the broadest is how many of these points actually go into your letter of intent? I don't want to handicap myself when I'm on sell or buy side, but sometimes on buy side, we actually prefer a little bit of ambiguity we may not have all the detail on risk allocation. Far more common that it is not there. So if it's very important to you, then this would be a term to try and flesh out. Will you be happy if the escrow is 25% on a first turn of the purchase agreement? Also, Paul mentioned on the EBITDA-based earnout, the anti-kickback uh, risk. But there's also a more fundamental issue, which is, Dependent upon your partner and other companies that they may have, how will you even define EBITDA and what kinds of cost might be allocated on the business? EBITDA can be a far more complicated measuring stick than just a net revenue or revenue based. And something else I always encourage sellers to think about is if there is any earnout at all, how do you have the ability to control that side of the business? If you are going to take a step back to the business at that point in time, uh, do you have any influence to grow or maintain the revenue if they're replacing the management? We would always assume and hope that that is an alignment, but at the same token, it could be risky for per, uh, uh, a portion of your um, purchase agreement. Anyways, just wanted to chime in. Paul, flip it back to you. No, absolutely. I, I absolutely agree with that. Thank you, Barry. Uh, so if we go to the next slide about navigating due diligence, kicking the tires, just a couple quick notes here to highlight. I think, you know, they see the top point about sellers preparation should start well before going to the market. This is something we alluded to just a moment ago. Uh, you put yourself as a seller in the buyer's position, anticipate what it is they're going to ask. I'd say ideally before you go to market, they're going to ask about your employer uh, employment arrangements, who are your employees, uh, any employment contracts that you have, independent contractor arrangements for healthcare professionals and others. They're going to ask about litigation, uh, any compliance plans that you have in place, 
training for your personnel and records of that training. And so as you as you think you know, about what you're going to be asked, consider about consider how well you'll be able to respond to those requests, will you, whether you will be able to respond or produce anything, and whether there may be some advanced work that you may want to do uh, before going to work so that you're in a better position to respond to the requests you know will come from your buyer and due diligence. At a minimum, uh, if you you've discover uh, an issue that may need to be resolved, it can give you the chance to do that before going to market. But even if you can't completely resolve an issue that should be before going to market, you'll be in a much better position once the question is asked and you won't be caught flat-footed. You'll have some idea of what the compliance issue may or may not be, have be able to provide a, in a better position to provide a response about how you are addressing that issue and also maybe have some thoughts about what the potential exposure might be, and it will lead to a much more productive conversation. And then buyer uh, reciprocally on that, the time you spend investing in a sound due diligence process, I've, I've found time and time again, although uh, somewhat burdensome or tedious, and we try to minimize that, very often can save you a lot of heartache, surprise, and, um, and disruption later on. So certainly a worthwhile investment. Uh, I think we've hit some of these other uh, issues, and we'll talk about them again in a moment. So I'm going to go past this next bullet point and turn it over to Barry uh, to talk a little bit about reimbursement. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, we just flipped to the next slide. Um, I think we covered a couple of these things, but just to back up for a second, I want to emphasize something that Paul said. I've been thinking about it in light of a home that I have to sell. How many of you begin to list your home and don't look around at the things that you might need to fix, your floors, your walls, some painting? We spend a lot of time on the sell side of the equation, really helping our sellers uh, get focused on these issues because what I find is that the well-organized seller, whether it be someone who's selling a piece of property or a business who's taking care of these things, ultimately benefits both from the time of the deal, uh, how long it takes to get from start to closing, but also the value of the deal. And some of those issues that Paul pointed out, including um, your escrow. Um, here are some of the reimbursement access issues that we're seeing. I think many of you who are on the phone call already know about these items, expanded uh, payment, which is fantastic for autism providers. I'll cover some of the good and bad news that's associated with it that I'm seeing on the government and commercial payer side of the equation. I'm gonna to roll to the next one in the interest of uh, some time. So as I mentioned, uh, we have this wonderful news. We've got more coverage. You heard from the Provident folks. We've got uh, strong interest in autism by private equity. And now we're seeing integration of various kinds of healthcare providers, and that creates synergistic opportunities. Also, I think a question that you ask who your partner might be. Um, the uh, less good, if you will, I hated to say bad news, is that we're seeing enhanced regulation. That's just the reality. We're seeing some states that are looking at implementing laws to license BCBAs, we're seeing enhanced insurance laws. We're seeing federal laws that are changing in a number of areas. Uh, as someone who deals with the government and commercial payers, we have confusing payer policies uh, for the modifiers that we might even use between BCBAs and RBTs, creating inconsistent, confusing guidelines, documentation guidelines. So what does all of this do? It creates audit risk, risk to the seller, and then obviously risk to the buyer uh, as a result of this changing dynamic that we have. It reminds me of what we saw years ago in the home health industry. A lot of small mom and pop home health agencies uh, dealing with how you document care in the home setting, expansion for private equity, and then what did we see follow? payer audits, government investigations, et cetera. I don't want to dwell on that too much. Next slide. So um, there are a lot of issues that we all know impact reimbursement. 
in network, out of network. Uh, the wonderful news is that we have more coverage, which is great. Uh, but for some of the payment relationships, we are now uh, finding that they are less. One of the questions that we always have to look at, both from a legal and business perspective, is what happens when you're out of network? How do you bill? What amounts may the patient or their family members most likely are responsible for? OON um, providers are free, uh, frequently looking at copayment and deductible collection practices. I think I already mentioned and others have mentioned audits, internal compliance programs. That is one of the top items that you will see on a diligence request list. Um, managed care contracts. We have to pause. And this is one of those where I like to pause as I'm cleaning up my house beforehand. What kinds of contracts will require consent? A lot of people say, well, it, it's just a stock purchase deal, but Many of your managed care agreements will still require at a minimum notice and some require consent for sure if it is something other than a stock or member purchase agreement. And then there's rate negotiation issues that also may be implicated because if you have to give notice, does that give the payer the opportunity to take a bite uh, from a dollar perspective? Um, we are seeing greater challenges with the payers in the supervision areas, particularly with BCBAs over RBTs. We're seeing greater challenges with the prior authorization process. And um, do those practices at the uh, provider match the payer requirements to the extent we can figure out what those are? Go on to the next one. Um, Lots of enrollment rules that we have to look at, and I think really since Paul had covered these in the interest of timing as well, this is one of those pause issues as well. Both sell side and buy side here, what kind of notification, consent, there are changing rules that we're seeing at the Medicaid area, uh, and certain transactions, which we call a chow, change of ownership, uh, require a formal consent. CHOI, which is a change of ownership information, um, may be more of a notification requirement, but it may have a pre-closing notification requirement. I think I already said that stock sales could impact licensure. And don't forget other payers. Go on to the next one. And I think, Paul, do I flip this back to you? Yes, Barry, thank you. So just a couple of quick highlights here, because I think we've touched on some of these elements. Uh, but, you know, Barry has, was talking a little bit about some of the additional regulatory uh, requirements that have sprung up over some time around autism providers, among other healthcare providers, along with access to payment, which is all, I think, generally a positive thing. But we do have to be mindful of um, the additional compliance requirements that some may not quite be aware have sprung up around them. Uh, depending upon uh, the history and size of the practice and sophistication of compliance practice. Some of the highlights, and this is not exhaustive by any means, but uh, if you are a covered entity under HIPAA, and in very general terms, that means if you're submitting payments electronically for uh, payment of healthcare services, you probably are a covered entity and you probably are subject to HIPAA along with other privacy requirements, you have to have a compliance plan in place. And historically, uh, due diligence around HIPAA and privacy issues, if you went back 10 years ago, would be probably much lighter, and I think people used to give it shorter shrift. We found, probably rightly so, folks are really taking a closer look at this, uh, in part because this, the fines for breach and violations can be very substantial, and enforcement has definitely picked up over the last several years. So you wanna be very mindful about whether these requirements may pertain to you as a seller and buyers certainly need to take a careful look and investment to check the compliance posture on that front. With the greater uh, uh, availability of government payment, we also see fraud and abuse issues, anti-kickback primarily, depending upon the circumstances, you might potentially have Stark Law involved, but probably more likely anti-kickback. and. This, look, this involves a close look at compensation arrangements between referral sources for payment when government payment is involved. It's important to take a careful look at those because what may make sense in other business transactions may be uh, in violation of law and put you in serious jeopardy when you're dealing with certain healthcare payers and services. 
So important to spend the investment there. The scope of health professional licenses. Are you have, do you have the right licensed professionals providing the right types of services in your autism provider center? Uh, this can get a little tricky and like other healthcare businesses, there can be overlap. You wanna make sure that folks are providing the right service, they have the appropriate license in place. And somewhat related to that, and when you go to the next point about corporate practice of medicine prohibitions and other corporate practice, th those, pro those prohibitions can vary significantly from state to state. And what may be appropriate in terms of employment or contracting of a health professional in one state may be a violation in another. Uh, and that can lead to serious uh, liability and consequences to the extent you don't have the right type of uh, entity employing the right type of professional. The most common trip up areas would be those involving physicians and psychiatrists, uh, but it is not necessarily limited only to those type of professionals. And then the final point on excluded individuals, especially as we get into more and more government payment involved for autism providers, is you wanna take care to make sure that any health professional or other employee you have working in your center has not been excluded from the Medicare program, the Medicaid program, uh, or others, and there are websites in order to be able to check that. All of this is important, not only for the fines and penalties that can arise if there are violations, but because they can also put your payment for services in serious jeopardy if you're not providing the services in accordance with these legal requirements. And if we go to the next slide, uh, I'll hit just a couple quick highlights on the definitive agreement. Some of this we've already touched on. Uh, the purchase agreement, which is probably your primary definitive agreement, there may be others, can be substantial in length. It really fleshes out the letter of intent, adds a lot more detail that you can't or just may not want to do uh, at the letter of intent stage. You want to negotiate that and, and prepare it ideally in conjunction with going through your due diligence process uh, in part because it will help inform what it is you need to address in your, uh, your definitive agreement and will also help inform any variations or changes you may need to think about in terms of description of what you're acquiring, in terms of risk allocation uh, and other issues. Your reps and warranties will be fleshed out in more detail in the definitive agreement both from the buyer and the seller. Typically, more reps and warranties are made by the seller uh, than the buyer, as you might expect. And those will, can range from compliance uh, to provision of all contracts, including material contracts, reps about litigation, about the right to assign or sell the assets at issue if, it's a, if it is an asset sale uh, and on down the line. Uh, we talked a little bit about risk allocation, back, baskets and caps, and some, def, some differences depending upon whether there are fundamental reps at issue or not in terms of the duration of indemnity obligations uh, and also uh, any caps that may be present on that. Disclosure schedules, things that you want to start working on very er as fairly early in the process because they can take time. Disclosure schedules are important in terms of exceptions that be, can be called out for reps and warranties. So uh, usually, you know, really heavy on the seller side, important to give time though for the buyer to review those, have discussions about them and make sure folks are clear. And if you have a purchase agreement that is both a sign and then close later, you wanna make sure that your reps and warranties and disclosure schedules are all accurate as of the time of the signing and the closing and then the closing conditions as we've outlined prior are the key deliverables, what has to occur before we get to the final consummation of the deal. And many times these closing conditions are structured so they can be waived by the party that's entitled to enforce them in their discretion. Barry, I don't know if you wanted to say a few words about closing and beyond the business practice risks. Yeah, let's just go real quickly through that. We covered some of these points earlier, but these are things that you really want to think about. You are going from dating to marriage. And where will the management personnel? Do you want to be in management? Uh, there are issues such as transitioning referral sources that may or may not happen based upon the type of transaction. Here are two topics, though, that I really want to know about. Are you guys going to put in a new billing system and when are you going to do that? Do you need one? Are you going to put a new EMR system in and when are you going to do that? Both of those things can impact the business, particularly in the documentation side for BCBA supervision and RBT therapy services. 
Um, so I want to know. It may be your expectation that they are going to do that. That will require CapEx. When are they going to invest it? How quickly will that happen? And if I have an earnout, by the way, does that transition period to a new EMR or billing system in any way impact the business revenue? And if so, how do I address for that? Um, there may be patient continuity and communication issues. Patients hear about the news that may happen about a transaction. You may want to get ahead of that. And also, in terms of your communication plan with your operational, clinical, or billing practices uh, and personnel that you may have, all of these things go into the soup pod from, wow, I just signed, to what do I do on a post-closing basis? I think we have one more, Paul, and we'll wrap up. Yes. Thanks, Barry. So I... Folks, I think we've hit the first three points up here about cultural fit, uh, what level of autonomy may be desired, and kind of clearly talking about those expectations between the seller and your uh, potential or private equity partner, and then talking about the amount of skin in the game, the uh, expectations of Horizon to the next liquidity event. So I don't think we need to spend more time on those particular points. I think it'd be good just maybe to close with the last two. And there's, there's a reason I find that uh, the saying exists, time kills all deals, is because it's true. Uh, there, no matter how things can make sense in terms of alignment of goals, the economics, the, the clinical goals, the objectives for growth, over time, if there's not clear parameters and a timeline set and benchmark set early on, I think you, you open yourself up to greater risk of time potentially killing your deal. And some of the reasons for that, I think that over time, other alternatives begin to present themselves to both the seller and the buyer. Uh, notwithstanding that there are exclusivity provisions, you become aware of other alternatives, other things you might be doing, um, and folks can sometimes over time start to get a little distracted, start looking at other possibilities. Other points can arise just in negotiation uh, and, and in discovery of the deal that cause strain uh, on those negotiations and sometimes change the early momentum and excitement um, into a different kind of a tone. And then I think deal fatigue and cost are a real thing uh, in, in deals, and when they tend to go beyond what the folks initially expect, uh, you again lose some of that early energy and momentum, uh, and that can, can certainly work and cut against the deal. So you want to have clear expectations and try to adhere to a timeline and benchmarks as best you can, understanding there may be some variance with that. And then finally, and this will sound self-serving, but I think it is right, uh, that you know, investment with with right healthcare counsel, with healthcare investment bankers, with other advisors, early on in the process uh, is I, I think usually helpful to help you get to a successful closing. To the extent you make those investments and have better information, you can help prevent going down a road that you really can't go down too far uh, and set up a deal structure that is in a particular state that is not permissible to be set up in that way in that state and there can be a lot of variance there you can evolve those structural or avoid those structural problems avoid anticipated timing delays uh, that aren't anticipated by the parties early on either related to licensing payer issues consents or other that could be identified earlier and have a plan to be able to deal with those uh, much earlier on avoiding those unwelcome delays and then certainly also in terms of identifying different goals, objectives, and terms that may end up being inconsistent with each other and identified too late in the deal process could potentially be avoided to the extent you start working with advisors uh, who, who live in this space very frequently. All those things, I think, will help contribute to a successful and timely deal closing. And Barry, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that. Nope. I think you hit it. Okay. Folks, we know we went a little over time, and uh, we really do appreciate those of you who have stuck around with us and hope you found this very helpful. We'd like to take a few minutes just to open it up for questions. Um, if anybody has to type them into the Q&A box panel, either on the top. So it looks like we got one question during the webinar around what is the range of multiplier uh, currently. Uh, so to, we, we expanded on that via the chat box, but to do so kind of for those folks that are still on the line, you know, because it is so aggressively being pursued by private equity groups right now, ABA practices or businesses are being valued 
really at all-time highs and, and really one of the more aggressive valuation sectors that we've seen kind of broadly within healthcare services compared to, you know, even other spaces within behavioral health, but certainly other spaces within behavior, within broadly healthcare services. When we think about how these group, how groups are valued or businesses are valued in autism services, it's based on an EBITDA as, um, uh, as was mentioned previously in the presentation. When we think about what that multiplier is to EBITDA, it's highly dependent on the size of the business and a lot of the other components that make the business up. Things like payer mix, things like geography, um, what is the service mix, the, the in-home versus center-based or the hybrid level of care. Um, but really, you know, what we're seeing is it's very common to see high single-digit multiples of EBITDA and then extending into the double-digit multiples of EBITDA for groups that do have size and scale. Um, so, you know, obviously multiple millions in EBITDA and, and certainly, you know, pushing north of, of 10 million in revenue, you start to see those multiples going into the, the double digits for businesses like that. We're also now seeing another question around you know, what is one of the more common reasons why deals don't transact or as, as we like to call them, blow up in diligence. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, the folks at Paulsonelli have something to add here, but you know, from our perspective at Provident, you know, one of the most common occurrences is, is really around the quality of earnings and, and really what that is, is once you get into diligence or you sign a letter of intent with a prospective buyer, one of the first things they're going to do is what's called a quality of earnings or really just basically have a third-party accounting firm come in and, and really fact-check the financial statements of the business. They're going to follow really everything from the billing data and flow that through to what's showing up in your QuickBooks and ensure and give it the stamp of approval that what we're showing or what you're showing is really matter-of-fact truth. And, and what we find is a lot of times through that quality of earnings, because the business has never been put through that type of rigor and financial reporting uh, before, there can be instances where the financials not necessarily take a hit, but there's some variances or discrepancies between what come back on that quality of earnings report and what we previously thought were truth within the business and not through any malintent by business owners, just through the fact that you know a lot of times these are smaller businesses management teams that aren't used to, again, that type of financial rigor that, that these quality of earnings firms are going to bring to that report. And so in those instances, there can be a change in the economic terms of a deal. Basically, the buyer can come back and, and signify that the EBITDA may not be as high as it was represented previously. And so the deal terms can be cut. Uh, and a lot of times that can lead to these deals not transacting because the dollars and cents weren't as high as previously thought by the business owners. And in our experience, a lot, and that doesn't happen often, but if we're diving into the deals that do blow up in diligence, that can be one of the main contributing factors. And the second, on the legal side of the equation, the second uh, most common that I see relates to the audit that will get conducted. Not the Q of E audit, but most sophisticated buyers, and I include most private equity buyers, uh, will conduct an audit by a third party company that will dive into the claims. They will look at a sample typically of a number of kids. They will pull documentation over a particular window of time and then they will match it up to the codes or codes that have been selected. And that tends to be the next thing that we see. You know, there's a report card grade. Uh, there's always some expectation that uh, I guess you could say some cleanup work may need to be done to help that platform go to the next level. Um, but uh, if there's a significant issue identified, uh, that typically can play itself out in one of two ways. One, uh, there's a walk from the deal as a result of diligence, or two, um, the purchase price may be impacted, or I guess three, uh, there will be a higher escrow amount that will need to be set aside and longer durations for um, the periods that might go with a healthcare rep. And then all those things go into the soup pot to shake up the economic value and the likelihood of closing. So anyways, I, uh, I see that typically as number two right behind Q of V. And then I think the last question I'm seeing here is what are some of the more common reservations business owners have about private equity? Um, I think 
from our perspective in communicating with business owners and, and really clinician owners around the country is really their biggest reservations about pursuing a private equity partner focus on the maintaining or the continuality of their high level of clinical quality. You know, these business owners, much like yourselves, have, have built out the business over many years through sweat equity and, and put a lot of thought in, in personal dollars into building a business at the standard of clinical quality that they, you know, hold their business in themselves to. And there's fear that by bringing a private equity partner in and growing and expanding the scale, you can lose sight of that quality standard over time. And I think that's a, a very well-warranted thought. And, and again, that goes back to some of the comments we made around the importance of selecting the right partner. Because ultimately, there are groups that can come in, and, and private equity groups, that you know, their growth thoughts around how to build the business could threaten the focus on that clinical quality and it needs to be done in a way that you don't lose sight of that and the, the back office management team that's put in place that can continue to oversee that quality. Um, so I think the way that we advise our clients through some of those reservations is you know, making sure that whatever partner that you pursue or whatever private equity group you ultimately partner with you know, believes in whatever that clinical quality is. We have clients that spend a lot more dollars on training, on oversight and supervision than necessary to ensure that you know, their employees are in the best position to provide the best level of care. And so as the business grows, finding a partner that believes that that extra investment in those types of oversights is important to not only the clinical quality of the, growth, the, bit, the business, but as you grow, that continues to be of importance so that you don't lose sight of that as you scale. And I think that that's not something that would be on the top of mind for every buyer, but certainly there's a large number of them out there that, that see the value in the quality and, and want to put systems in place to ensure that as you scale and grow, you don't lose sight of that. That's actually all the time we have for today. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, you can feel free to reach out directly to the speakers. Their emails and telephone numbers are displayed here on the screen. And as a reminder, the webinar will be recorded and will be distributed at the end of this week. Thank you so much for joining us today, everyone. We really appreciate it. Have a good day.